All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get started, please. Uh, <clears throat> Take the if we could get the meeting to come to order. Um, Ms. Goodell, could you call the roll, please? Uh, yeah, Mr. Anderson? Here. Mr. Castillo? Here. Ms. Gill? Here. Ms. Litton? Here. Mr. Reitinger? Here. Ms. Russell? Here. Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Thank you. I'd like to um, present the agenda with one small change. Um, Mr. Anderson would like to have a couple of minutes at the end of the session to talk about uh, the operational and governance principles for board discussion. So uh, with the board's permission, we'll add that as topic 5.04. With that modification, um, could I ask for unanimous consent to adopt the agenda? Seeing no objection, so ordered. The next item on the agenda is item 2.01, West Falls Church Development Team presentation. Dr. Noonan. Thank you, Mr. Reininger. Good evening, everybody, members of the board, um, community, uh, and, and guests. We welcome you this evening. Um, tonight we have an opportunity to hear from uh, the West Falls Church Development Team, led by Evan Goldman. Um, Evan is going to be our new best friend, I think, here in the City of Falls Church. Um, and uh, they're going to speak to uh, the, the project on the adjacent um, site to the new high school. Um, but before they do, I want to welcome Wyatt Shields, our City Manager. Uh, thank him publicly for his incredible partnership um, and uh, turn the floor over to you. So if you wouldn't mind pushing the button there and, and you, let you take it over. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. And, um, and it has been really an amazing partnership of how closely I think uh, the, the school staff and the city staff have worked together on this project and the city council and the school board. And we do that formally through the campus coordinating committee, but we're doing it every day as we're working through problems on this. Uh, and, and solutions uh, for for what we're trying to accomplish on the to build a great high school and and have economic development to help pay for it and create a great place. Um, so for tonight, um, Mr. Goldman will give a presentation uh, of of the uh, conceptual plan for the 10 acres, and then after that, I can speak to some of the terms that are in the interim agreement and the schedule. But since people are probably most interested in what Mr. Goldman has to say, let me turn it over to him, and he can introduce the team, and then uh, then I'll speak to some of those terms that I just mentioned. Thank you, Wyatt. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for allowing us to uh, present tonight. Uh, we're really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Evan Goldman. I'm a partner at EYA. We're a development firm that's been around for about 25 years locally, and also another <laughs> My name is Sean Seaman. I'm a principal executive vice president with PN Hoffman, uh, also local regional developer. I've uh, been developing for over 25 years now and uh, most recently completed the Southwest Waterfront, the wharf development in D.C. Um, and we're uh, taking on the multifamily, the hotel, the office in uh, sort of a, a joint development scenario with Regency Partners who, I don't think there's somebody here tonight, but Regency Partners is our, our retail uh, partner on the job. Yeah, and so even though you see, you might see me at some evening presentations, you might see Sean, we're working everything on, on this collectively, the, the two of us as well as our partner Raphael um, and the Regency team. Uh, we also have um, from Torty Gals, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, good evening, I'm Murphy Antoine. I'm a, uh, an architect and planner with Torty Gallus and Partners. Um, so uh, as I said, thank you for uh, allowing us to present. I'll kind of walk through the presentation. And of course, as you have questions, feel free uh, to jump in. Um, this is kind of the structure of our team, which we talked about, um, but uh, we do have some local representation as well. And so Walter Phillips um, is, uh, Antoinette is here tonight. And then we also have um, our lawyer, Dave Lasso, Lasso, who's right across the street from City Hall as well. Gorf Slade is working with us on the traffic side and Clark Builders Group on the construction. Uh, this is an overall um, plan. This is what we submitted back in August with our second submission um, for the RFQ. And we'll walk through kind of the key planning principles. Some of you have already seen this presentation, so I recognize some of your faces. So I apologize if I'm boring you with the same details over and over, but um, I do see some new faces. So, um, But the uh, you guys know the site extremely well, obviously, because it's the school today. 
Um, one of the main planning uh, issues of the site is the hill, and so it's a pretty big slope from Haycock up to the center retail street. Um, it's about 26 feet, so two and a half stories, um, to give you a frame of reference. And so that really helped uh, help dictate quite a bit about the site. And so originally when we thought about the site, we assumed this would be the retail street, going all the way from Federal Realty's property up to the entrance to the school. Um, and it became clear, given the slope, that that wouldn't work. You wouldn't be able to have outdoor cafe seating. It wouldn't be um, as accessible for, for people in wheelchairs or people that are handicapped. Um, and so the idea here was to come up with something that would really work great for retail, um, which is going to set the stage for this to be a great place. And so that's why the retail street ended up here, where it's relatively flat at the top of the hill. Um, second reason for that was that this uh, main street points towards the metro. And we want to reorient people in this neighborhood towards the metro station. It's a huge asset for the community, even though it's not in the city proper. Um, essentially, it is the city's metro stop. And so making sure that that um, drive, that uh, Main Street and the retail and everything kind of points people towards it, and that the opening along Leesburg Pike is, is wide enough that as people drive by, bike by, walk by, they know something exciting is going on inside the, the street. And they decide to turn there and investigate it and start looking and seeing what's back there from the parks to the retail and everything else. The uh, a third issue is we have a grocery store um, that we're planning for down here at the corner of Haycock and Seven. And so that has a certain dimension to it as grocery stores do um, along with their parking. And so that largely dictated the size of this block. Um, and just because most grocery stores have very specific dimensions that they'll work within. Um, the other planning construct, which is probably the most important was how the development was gonna interact with the school and so the original plan that many of you have probably seen had a field, kind of a big play field right here, um, sports field, I should say, mm -hmm. with parking on either side. And while we were, you know, our initial submission dealt with that and had that as a separation between our development and the school, we were really excited when you selected Stantac Gilbane and they had this idea of the plaza in front of the high school entrance. We just think it creates, it's a great use of space. It creates a wonderful space for the school. Um, and we were pretty excited about that. It also allows us to cut, create a street grid that connects through so that you have more porosity throughout the site. And so that, you know, when there, you know, God forbid, when there's an accident, people have different ways to go and to get around the site. You don't have all, every, all the cars getting locked up in one location. And it also creates a better pedestrian and uh, bicycle connection to the school itself. Um, and it allows us to treat this edge in a really attractive way, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, finally, the kind of last main construct that helped us come up with our plan was phasing. And so uh, if you think about projects you've seen develop over time, it's critical that you get enough critical mass in that first phase, <clears throat> that the retail can be successful, uh, that the park space is, is largely done and complete, uh, that it feels like a place on day one. Um, there are projects that are phased over long periods of time where you have a building or two develop over time. Um, it also takes them a really long time to get um, buy-in from the community to feel like a place, to feel safe, to feel like a, a place you want to be. Uh, you kind of have construction going on for ages and ages. And so that was one of the things we looked at closely was how do we deliver enough upfront land value to the city? Um, and how do we create a big enough place in that first phase to really leave our mark um, with this project? And that led us to this idea of breaking up the uses into multiple different buildings and different uses. So multifamily apartments, condominiums which won't compete with each other because these are people buying and these are people renting, um, a kind of a civic music venue space, a hotel, senior housing and office. When you add up all those different components, um, they, they, are, they, they work symbiotically. I mean, there's no, they're not competing with each other. Um, and so that allows us to deliver all that construction at once, which is almost you know, around 900,000 square feet of development. So it's a big project. Uh, but when it's done and we've peeled off the Band-Aid and opened it, um, it's going to be fantastic. Um, and then it leaves the second phase of construction largely protected and further away from the school so that when you guys are open and we're done with our portion of the project, you're not worried about future construction right outside your front door. Um, oh, sorry. There's a, a larger vision that we're also interested here. So we think the 10 acre high school site's incredible. And if that's the only project that ever gets built here, it's perfect or it works really well. But there's also an opportunity to expand it towards the metro, and it's relatively critical. You know, we want this main street to continue all the way back towards the metro for that to be a nice, long pedestrian street that's comfortable and safe and well lit and attractive, and people are going to want to bike and walk on that street. And that's how you encourage people to use the metro, make it feel safer for your students who may want to get to the metro after school, to not feel like they're walking past, you know, through a dark parking lot at night. 
um, or at the end of the school day in the winter. So that connection is really critical. Um, one of the only ways you can increase transit ridership is creating really nice, attractive, safe, connected streets to the transit. Um, and so that's what this would do. Uh, so Virginia Tech has, um, sorry, Virginia Tech has selected us as one of two potential developers for their parcel, their eight acre uh, site. Um, their goal from what we've heard is that they wanna stay there with an academic building and potentially expand. And so what we've been responding to as part of our response to them was a student and faculty housing building, and then um, an three academic buildings around a quad uh, with an innovation center um, as well. And we've, been, uh, we've talked to Superintendent Newton about that concept and figuring out ways that the collaboration between uh, the high school and the, the uh, university can actually be expanded, not just continue the way they are, but even expanded. Um, and so we are resubmitting to Virginia Tech in January and um, hope to hear sometime in the next year or six months or so um, what their thoughts are. Whether it's us or not, the key here would be making sure that the street gets pushed all the way through. Um, you know, you don't want people to have to feel like they need to walk all the way around that site in order to get to the metro. That's a pretty big barrier, um, but we're optimistic that something will happen. The last piece of the puzzle is WMATA, who, who has filed a comprehensive plan amendment with Fairfax County, and they are closely following this whole process. So um, once again, we are certainly interested in redeveloping that site. We hope to be the developer that they ultimately select. Um, but if we're not, just the redevelopment of that site in general will be really critical to the uh, overall neighborhood. Uh, this is a perspective image. Um, and mind you, these were done relatively quickly during the RFQ process. So you know, the, architecture, the architecture is more placeholder here than anything else. But what we were um, trying to show with the architecture was uh, buildings that had a lot of brick um, were kind of appropriate for Falls Church, um, which is something you see in the city quite a bit. Uh, this low building here uh, to the right is probably the most exciting. So this is the hotel. And attached to the hotel is the uh, second floor music venue with an outside deck and retail on the first floor. And that's the building closest to the high school. So it's um, on the back side of that building, as you'll see in a second, is a music school fronting towards the high school entrance. In the center, we have these kiosk buildings to really get people into the parks. Um, and so that center, that entire center space is almost an acre um, of land and you have space for outdoor yoga, for music, for music, for movies in the park, for uh, festivals in coordination with the city. Um, so things that we can do to really get the public there and really have the residents of City Falls Church as well as the school community um, kind of see this as part of their community. Um, and from a retail, well, I'll get to it in a second, I'll talk about the retail mix, I think, on the next slide, um, two slides. And this is an image from inside the park space itself, and you can see it's pretty broad. It's 60 feet wide, uh, almost 60 feet wide from curb to curb on the inside. So it, it has the really has the dimension that you would need to make a nice park space and there would be kind of larger spaces for gathering as well as more intimate spaces for sitting and having smaller conversations really good tree canopy coverage um, going across the whole main street including the central park so that you have um, shade which is pretty critical um, as we get hotter and hotter um, as an area and then in this uh, view you're seeing the music venue off here on the second floor um, towards this is looking towards virginia tech um, this space right here is that main park space once again and so that's what i was talking about right here with the central gathering space right at the main intersection um, kind of smaller space for programming uh, we haven't done a lot of detailing here yet but the idea of having fountains and public art and sculpture and um, you know really fun activities for things for people to enjoy um, when they're in that space as well and then what you also see on the first floor is there's retail on almost every edge of the buildings and that makes the spaces safe and alive and and um, well-lit and pedestrian-oriented outdoor cafes and really make this a, a center for the community. Uh, one of the merchandising concepts that we've talked about is for this to be a place for families within Falls Church. And so with the high school and the middle school specifically, um, we want to do things that embrace that community so that um, they have options after school, options, quite frankly, before school, that families, when they come to the uh, area, can grab coffee or get dinner after school. Um, hang out there on weekends as well and it really becomes a place for families in the neighborhood and so this is that music venue space right here on the ground floor on the back side the idea is to have a music school that would be in coordination with the music venue upstairs and then would have the ability to work with the high school as well um, and what's nice about that is that it fronts the back side of your high school plaza and it creates this opportunity for that plaza to engage in music in some way whether it's you know, weekend classes or after school classes and the windows are open or people are out in the park 
um, playing music in some way it really could activate that space um, when you guys aren't using it for school functions. Um, and music could become a theme of that area, um, especially given the programs at George Mason. Um, likewise, that you know can also play on the, on the main street as well with the music venue upstairs. Um, if you've been to the wharf, you know you guys program kind of music in so many different ways there, and it, it's a critical way to bring people together um, and create an exciting place. Um, and there'll be kind of other retail opportunities throughout that are are oriented towards students in that way. <clears throat> this is a slight, this is, uh, I don't know how critical this is, but this is a, I, we've been just furthering the idea of the plan a little bit and playing around with blocking diagrams. And so this is um, the next iteration of that. The one thing that really, um, that I wanted to show, and the reason I brought this slide was this idea of potentially screening the garage with some building, with senior housing, um, and having that be so that that garage face is not open if you guys ultimately choose to have a garage there. Um, and so that's what that could look like. And then speaking of the garage, um, you know, there's this idea, obviously, if we, if the school's school board ultimately decides not to do an above grade parking shared deck there, the parking would be below grade. But if it is above grade, we think there's ways to make it attractive to do art on the buildings. Um, and one of the ideas there would be to actually work with the school's arts community um, in order to figure out what that's going to feel like and look like and actually have student art be part of that. Um, and so whether it's murals on canvas or it's murals on ceramic or it's um, art on the buildings proper or it's an, you know, an annual event where graduates or students in the high school actually come up with a design for the year and make their mark on that building, it creates an opportunity to kind of have living art um, from the school actually out there on display for everyone to see, um, which is just kind of an interesting idea. Um, it's something that some other schools, one of my, my daughter's school actually does an, an annual, um, the whole class gets together and comes up with ideas for a ceramic mural. And then they add on to this continuous living mural every year. And it's based upon the themes of what happened in the world that year. Um, and they come up with kind of what it's going to look like. That's always done in ceramic and attached to a concrete wall, but it could be, you know, multiple different ways. And, and we'd want to work with the school community to come up with that, uh, what, what that idea might want to be. Um, this is similar concept, but these are banners versus art on the building itself. Um, and then we took some liberties. So Torty Gallus drew this idea of, you know, how do you market the actual school or have the school be part of that? And so you can obviously see the Mustang fronting towards the high school plaza. Um, and that's representational. It can be, obviously, we've worked with your community to figure out what the right design is, but then similar with the middle school, one of the things that we've heard just in the few sessions we've done with the public is this goal of making sure the middle school and high school have their own identity and that they're still strong identities. And so to the extent we can figure out ways to have the garage play into that so that one doesn't kind of overwhelm the other, um, but then also give you an opportunity along seven to really make sure everyone knows this is where the school entrance or the school campus entrance is. Um, and so that might be something that's shared between both the middle school and high school from a design perspective. So there's a really fun opportunity here to work collectively on you know, what this wants to be and how it wants to look and feel and how it integrates with the, uh, with the school. Um, and then finally, I'll close on these last few slides. Um, what, what are both P and Hoffman and EYA, our expertise, a lot of it is around placemaking. And so the wharf is phenomenal. Um, before I was at EYA, I worked on a pro project called Pike and Rose up on Rockville Pike uh, for about eight years. And both of those are known for kind of a high level of kind of visual beauty, beautiful landscaping and sculpture and art, and then also for having events that bring people together. And so it's not really worth creating a space unless you're gonna have people in that space. And so, um, and that's how you activate it. That's how people remember it and they keep coming back. So um, you know, these are images from projects of ours where you're seeing different things going on and it's everything from arts festivals to music festivals to farmer's market to uh, concerts. Um, uh, you know, and those will be tailored towards the Falls Church community. And we would work with all of you to figure out what those right events might be and work with our retail tenants, quite frankly, they'll often sponsor too. And it's these big things, you know, once a month, let's say, but it's also the little things, um, you know, the Sunday morning yoga at 9 a.m. in the park or the um, often retailers will do meetups for running or um, biking clubs where you, everybody joins there, they go on their run, and at the end of the day, they grab coffee somewhere. And so those are the types of things we like to curate, um, and they, over time, really get taken over by the community. So even though we may seed them, uh, a good place means that the community has taken it over as their neighborhood, and so that's um, important over time. So collaboration will be really critical. Um, materials and landscaping are pretty critical to making a place feel great. Um, and so the, the trees, the shade trees, their location, the landscaping really wants to spill out um, and really, because uh, it's just visually beautiful um, and it often acts as a nice buffer between cars and 
sidewalks. Um, water, the sound of water is really um, nice in public open spaces. Um, you can see planters, vases, and even the architecture on the buildings. Um, and then sculptural elements, you know, that middle image on the bottom is, those are spitting birds, and that's based on the history of Montgomery County and the birding culture there, the fact that the Grosvenor family um, founded the Audubon Society there. And so we did all this research into the history of Montgomery County when we created Pike and Rose and came up with this theme of birds um, that's throughout the project. So, you know, the average person is going to walk down the street and have no idea where that came from. But for those of us who know Montgomery County, there's that moment of, oh, this makes sense. Um, and culturally, it just fits with that community. And we would want to do that same type of historical deep dive in Falls Church and figure out what it is about this community that wants to come out through the public art and sculpture. Um, and the bottom left, one of the most critical things about great places is really great uh, landscape furniture. And so furniture that's movable, where people can have ownership of their space. Um, you know, they can move it into the sun when it's cold. They can move it into the shade when it's too hot. Um, they're not kind of bolted down as if, you know, everyone's a criminal and is going to steal the furniture. Um, so that's pretty important. Um, and this image right here is great. It's actually around a fire pit at the wharf. You can see kind of the logs of firewood behind it, um, which is artistic and then also practical. So uh, I think that's where we get a lot of our excitement from is creating these great places. And then, you know, we'll be looking forward to working with you guys over the next uh, however many years uh, on the project and coming up with these types of good, really great ideas. Uh, so that is the overall presentation, but we can answer whatever questions you guys have. know a lot of this has not been figured out but kind of about traffic uh -huh. um, in the rendering it looks like traffic would be able to drive basically onto school property and that kind of road in front of the school okay um, to me that's a little bit concerning are we gonna have constant traffic on school property from the economic development, you know, right. during the day, is it going to be like cars going by when kids are coming in and out of school, when classes are going on? So, right. what is the plan for that road? So, so we've had um, we've had two sessions, I guess, now with the schools team, and they've raised that issue. So we've had that conversation, um, and the most recent idea that we were talking about was the idea that there could be um, bollards here, where this portion of the street could close during uh, morning and afternoon bus rush hour. Um, where you guys are really using these streets or buses and it's the most crowded and you pick up and drop off. Um, and so that would, that would kind of alleviate the crossing of traffic during those moments of the day. Um, other than that, I know, I know that we're hoping to ultimately have a, a traffic light here that allow cars to really make this the main street that most of the auto traffic would be driving on. Um, and our garage entrances are off of seven, off of right here and off of here. So, you know, there's, there wouldn't be a reason why people would be going here unless there's an accident or there's some sort of issue and cars need to be rerouted. So the, there's pros and cons. Um, and I think this street can be designed in a way that makes sure that cars are behaving and driving slowly. But the more you restrict traffic, the more you get traffic. So there is a benefit to having a shared network of streets, even if it is restricted during certain hours of the day, um, because you want the ability for cars to be able to be flexible and getting around a site. Um, and one of the issues we have in the suburbs is as cars are more and more restricted, you end up with cars on less streets, which means those streets get backed up even more. So we, I'm a big proponent of smart growth. I'm a big proponent of as much gridded streets as possible, and, but then understand the concerns of, you know, when there's major overflow. And so to the extent we can have kind of solutions during the right periods of the day, I think that makes a lot of sense in separating it out. Okay. Because, yeah, it does concern me that that's school property that will become... Right. Um, a major thoroughfare because if anybody's you know if you've been on Haycock at yep. um, rush hour when people are coming out of the metro there are massive amounts so you know I could just imagine people cutting through there right. you know yeah so a the, lot of issues around so there. this is so the main idea right you have Haycock here which is an intersection that has an issue and so for cars coming <laughs> in this direction that want to go right towards route 7 the nice thing about what we're proposing is by lining this up Obviously, we need the Virginia Tech connection to happen, but by lining that up, it creates a way for cars to go this way um, that would avoid, you know, I mean, I guess in extreme situations, they might go this way as well, um, but you, that really is the directed route for cars to be able to go and kind of avoid this intersection. And if there's a left turn there, in, then it allows the same thing for cars to really go this way. 
we're not proposing, I don't know what the school's proposing. We haven't thought about there being a, a left in here, but if there were, that would create that type of traffic cut through. But as long as that's not, cars would be kind of forced this way um, to use that route um, as a secondary backup when Haycock is backed up. So it does kind of create a parallel second street there, which literally could have the amount of traffic that you have at that intersection today. I'll ask a quick question while we're talking about traffic. So um, one of the things, one of the concerns that comes to mind when I look at this is the mosaic, um, uh -huh. which is a grid of streets with a huge number of pedestrians and a lot of four-way stops. And it's really, well, it's a nice place. It's a nightmare to walk through or drive through, um, especially at all of the intersections where there's multiple lanes of cars going, some turning right, some turning left, and there's pedestrian gridlock. Um, all of the time. Have you started to map where the entrances and exits are to buildings and how the, you know, the traffic might flow so that it doesn't replicate that experience? That's, that's a good question. So we haven't, we haven't mapped the entrance of the buildings yet at all. We're, you know, obviously we're pretty conceptual at this point. We're just starting to get into conversations about garage entrances and things of that sort. We've started thinking about where loading is because that's important. Um, it's interesting. I mean, Mosaic is Mosaic is different a little bit from this location in that it's a little harder to get to the main entrance. So you're constantly kind of going to the next street and doing a U-turn to get to the main entrance. So it creates an issue out on Route 50 or Gallows. Um, but within the development, I mean, Mosaic does have really good urban planning principles. I mean, it has broad sidewalks. It has stop signs at traffic lights. I mean, at the intersections, it has um, the kind of urban, it, it actually has what you want to, to encourage people to walk and bike. And so it is difficult to design a place that works for cars, you know, and allows the car thoroughfare to really rule, and then also is great for bikes and pedestrians. So, and that's what you kind of have on Route 7, right? Route 7 is, works for cars generally, much certainly over pedestrians and bikes, and we really don't want to create that on our property or the property here. We want this to be a place that is more priority towards peds and bikes. Um, and so you do that through good street design. I think one benefit of the way we've thought about this is these are one-way pair streets. So that's a one-way street and that's a one-way street. So what's nice about that is as you're getting to this intersection, you're not worried about the oncoming traffic making a left in front of you because there is none. You're just making a one-way straight street there. That is safer for pedestrians and bike cyclists as well because you're not worried about looking in the opposite direction. Um, and so that is a safety feature that will be good for pedestrians. It also does force cars to slow down a little because it's a more narrow driving lane than you would have in a two-way street where you've got a much bigger kind of paving, paving area. And that slowing down of the cars is actually great for the retail because they start looking in and seeing what's going on in the retail stores. Much better for pedestrians and bikes, much better for students. Um, but it does mean when you're driving on that street, you won't be driving more than 20, 20 25 miles per hour. And that's better because you have a lot less deaths when people are hit by cars at 20 or 25 miles per hour than when they're hit above 35. So to make this successful, the streets need to be designed in a way that works for peds and cyclists and retail and, and are safe um, and, and it not as a thoroughfare. So, um, so Mosaic, I think Mosaic is successful in that way. While it may be frustrating to drive through at times, it is actually very successful from the other side of it, right? Uh, I mean, that's kind of what they're going for. I, I think one, one point that I'd add and something that we observed at the, at the wharf is because we actually introduced vehicular traffic right on the water's edge, right. which we did. We, we, we went into that knowingly to try to create an environment where pedestrians felt comfortable walking out in the middle of traffic, but you could still do valet drop off and things like that. So we have a little bit of experience of the interaction between pedestrian and vehicle. It's been pretty successful so far because it slows the cars down. But the the one principle that we've we looked to was to create entrances to the parking garages for the people that were coming to the wharf that were going to park their car and then get out and enjoy the pedestrian environment to have the parking garages as close to Main Avenue as possible right. and have them well signed. And I think the the signage so that people know Merrifield, I, I think my my experience there at Mosaic is just it's difficult. I mean, the parking garage is a bit dysfunctional, and it seems like most of the people at that main intersection are looking for parking, hoping that they can snag an on-street parking spot. So I think it, it, one thing we'll look at is parking entrances, convenient parking, so that if you're driving there, you can get into the garage quickly and people know where the parking is and that they're not afraid that, you know, it's going to be hard to get in and out of the garage, but it's actually convenient, and that's probably where you want to park when you're there and so if I could add as well that, that they're also that those entrances and those garages are towards the front of the project 
So in the plan, you'll see the concentration of the garages and the parking is on Route 7. So the idea is really to get people in, to get them parked, and then they're walking so that it's not a lot of driving in. So when they have access to the garages closer to up front, that, that facilitates it. And also putting one on the right side and one on the left side is intended to reduce the back and forth. So you pick the one, you go to the big one when you're going to the grocery store, you go to the other one when you're parking and walking up and down the retail, right. but get people there, get them out of their cars, and then they're walking. So while we're talking about safety, I'll just ask one more question. When you, uh, when you went through the plan, you talked a lot about the connection to the metro, mm -hmm. um, which makes eminent sense. But one of the things that at least I'm concerned about is the connection to the city going this way. Mm -hmm. Now, it's less immediate because you know the federated site is not immediately up for development. Right. But the, the, you know, that's where a lot of our kids are going to be coming from especially if they're walkers or bikers. And I wonder if you started to think about not only how this site can be designed, or maybe this is a question for Wyatt, but how we can continue a question of um, making you know, the transit essentially from the bike path to this site uh, safer for bikers and cyclists and, and more pedestrian and retail friendly to be yeah. frank. Agreed. Do you want to handle the yeah. Yeah. Your uh, the connections to the WNOD trail, the connections um, for bicyclists to get to the school. It's one thing to plan it on the site, but we need to get them there safely. We do have a bicycle master plan, and it actually has bicycle traffic going through the federal property. But we've got a lot of work to do to make that be a practical option. Um, we do have the NVTA grant and that is really geared towards doing those types of improvements. So we have a problem, we have some money to help try to solve it, um, and, but we need to do a lot of work together to have good solutions. Um, and, and part of it, I think, and you had mentioned the other night, what, what hopefully will happen is that this will be an economic generator where other projects will start happening in the western part of the city, so that as those projects redevelop, and I think you're, there's a master plan process at some point, um, opening so that that would really allow the infrastructure to be built going all the way eastwards towards the main part of the city um, and that may take a longer period of time obviously but as long as the plan is correct and has the right street section and the right locations for everything that will happen over time and then on our site what we're doing is the lanes going north south um, have bike lanes in the shoulder um, so there's bike lanes on that main street and then right and we've been kind of talking with the schools quite frankly about bike lanes on either school road or on that center road but there would be bike lanes east west as well so once you get to our property you'll have good access to the schools by bike um, and then i think over time you'll get the fill in all the way to the trail thank you mr chair uh is there going to be any on-street parking here mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so all those streets have, you can see some of the cars kind of parked there, um, but all the streets have on-street parking on them. I think it's about 50 or 60 parking spaces on grade, and then the rest are in the garages. And with respect to public transportation, do you plan for bus access? Will, will buses be transiting this site? So we haven't, you know, we, pr we probably need to get smarter on that. That question actually came up last night, too, and we haven't gotten into the details yet to understand what the bus routes are and how they play. But to the extent there's a bus route on 7 that's right in front of the site, that actually would be great. Um, and there is bike share um, as well, which is important, too. Um, and we'll have plenty of bike storage for our own um, tenants and, and uh, occupants of the buildings. But, yeah, we should probably get uh, more up to speed on that. We've, we've already s we have signaled to the regional transit authorities that uh, the routing that currently goes to by, via Haycock to access West Falls Church, an option would be to have it go right through the heart of the site to mm -hmm. access Falls, West Falls Church. But we've got work to do before uh, that gets finalized. Cool. And there was a little bit of discussion last night about a potential um, shuttle connection to the metro itself, which wouldn't necessarily need to be part of even the larger bus system but could be something as part of the development, which is, again, something that uh, the that, uh, that P. Hoffman's done at the war. So, so uh, on the transportation issue, actually, a serious, serious question. H how will uh, scooters fit into this site? 
Um, it's so funny. It's like I, I don't know yet because I haven't done a project since scooters have become a thing. <laughs> um, it's such a new phenomenon over the last year or so that it, you know, it's, it's um, especially the electric scooters that is becoming this huge debate because people don't know exactly what to do with them. Have you had experience at the wharf yet we, on that? We have them at the wharf. I, I don't know that we have a solution yet. I think the, the obvious problem is that they just get left, you know, discarded, not parked properly and all over the site. Um, I haven't really noticed a problem with it. I mean, I think it, the, the more transit opportunities and ways to get people to the site, the better. And yeah, I think one of the things we'll have to look at is proper places for bicycles to park, whether it's bike share or, you know, people's personal bikes. And then also, you know, having, I mean, maybe it's a scooter parking site where you just identify, you know, a 10 by 10 area where scooters are supposed to be parked on the site. Right in the middle of the park. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and then yeah. curves. And, yeah. You know, those little wheels don't take bumps sure. too well. So. Well, I mean, well, everything will be ADA uh, accessible. So, I mean, we'll have ramps at every at, at every intersection. I don't think that'll be a problem. But I don't even know what the rules are in Fairfax County as far as or the city as far as scooters being on sidewalks versus streets. I know in the district you have to actually ride them on the street or in a bicycle lane. So, yeah, are you are you a scooter? You look like you have experience, or what you No, I. I <laughs> he has an opinion. I, 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 I look to better, better minds than mine to sort that out. But, yeah, but one there, last. I'm sorry. Go for it. One last question: How does that yellow, and I assume that yellow really extends to the condo and office? How does that map to the division of the parcels, and how would that map to the subdivision, in terms of eighty ten, the seventy thirty? We've, we've got to uh, really kind of work that out, and um, I think we'll have a discussion um, later on this as well. Um, so I don't know the answer to that question yet, uh, but we'll work through a couple of options, specifically to how the shared parking is, is uh, treated. But the yellow here is intended to show a phasing yeah. a diagram. So this is more about what gets built in the first phase than necessarily the property one. And there is some correspondence, but it's not That's a right. one for one in the, on this diagram. Okay, and then just one last thing. Could you talk a little bit about option B? Option B. The or, not, or oh, months. yeah. The not shared parking garage? What, yeah. what would that look like? So essentially, if this goes back to being the surface parking lot, um, the office and senior housing spaces would go below these buildings um, underground and the this garage would get a little bigger to handle the additional retail parking and that retail parking would go over here um, but there's a there's a few reasons why we propose this I mean number one obviously it's less expensive to build above grade parking so we can afford to pay the city a little more money um, for the school but secondly um, you know whether surface parking is the best use of land is a question the ability to do some sort of marketing graphics on the building is interesting. And then it recreates this great opportunity for the school to have overflow parking right next to the school. And so you have your 187 parking spaces in that garage that would be dedicated to the school. But on your overflow nights when you have a ton of parking, you know, you're that you have a huge 800 space garage there that people can park in and get to the school right across the street. Um, and then lastly, you know, we don't know where car cars are going um, and whether everyone's going to own a car in the future um, or um, self-driving cars are going to become a bigger place in what we do 10, 15 years from now. So by doing this, it's a fairly inexpensive temporary solution for parking. And in 15 years, 20 years, depending on how we're all getting around, there's the opportunity to take that down and build something there. If that parking is below grade, you've spent or we've spent you know, millions and millions of dollars building below grade parking, which becomes obsolete. And there's almost no use for that space below grade if you're not parking tons of cars there. So there's kind of future proofing uh, benefits as well that, believe it or not, are being thought of in, in the development industry now of we don't really know where parking's going 10 years from now. What, what about air rights on that? I mean, mm -hmm. doing a Boston on that parking garage, would that be? Yeah, so that question came up also at the Planning Commission. So so there's a few options here. So that's a precast parking deck, which means it's not poured in place concrete. It's like members that come in and get dropped in place. So structurally, it's not intended to have much or of anything on the roof or, or built above it. Uh, the Ballston solution is a poured in place concrete deck. So that, you know, could have that's real structure, which is why they could build the hockey um, rink above it. 
Um, to change this garage to port in place would be about $10 million more expensive. So it's obviously then the payment to the city goes down, the, you know, the benefit to the city goes down. Um, we are looking into what it would cost to beef up the structure in a precast deck to allow something to happen on top of that. I just don't have that answer yet. Um, but it, it does cost more money because you're adding more structure. Other questions from board members? Mr. Anderson? Sure. Um, so I'm noticing the shared parking garage, at least in the diagram right now, Evan has what appears to be photovoltaics. That mm -hmm. leads to talk about the sustainability features that you have in mind. I know you've talked about lead gold uh, for the neighborhood as a whole and various levels of lead certification yep. for the various buildings. But can you remind me how all that might work? And then I'm looking at is that actually in the thought process to have the PV panels on the roof, that sort of thing? Yeah, great question. So, so sustainability, -wise, both both of our companies and Regency have a good amount of experience on sustainability. So uh, we've committed to lead gold ND, neighborhood development. Um, we've committed to lead gold for a number of the buildings on the site. Um, we'll be doing, uh, you know, from a site feature perspective, from a stormwater management perspective, from a shading perspective, from a you know, the colors of the roofs, the green roofs, all that stuff that we'll be doing to make sure there's not a lot of heat island effect on the site as well. Um, and then from a solar perspective, um, at the Pike and Rose Garage, we did do a solar farm, solar carports on top of the garage, um, which is attractive and it was, it, people really like it. It actually covers your car in the summer and in the winter. Um, there are state credits in Maryland that allowed that to happen. Um, and so we haven't done enough yet of research here um, to look into what it would be involved to do that here, but we'd like to do it if we can. We also would, uh, we're talking to um, Commissioner Steve, uh, I think it's Stevens, right, Tim Stevens, um, about PACE, which is a, a potential way to fund sustainability. And so that could be an interesting thing to use here for funding uh, solar. In Pike, at Pike and Rose, that solar farm is the energy usage for all the lights in the garage, as well as part of the hotel next door. So it really does, you really do get a pretty big benefit from it. Um, and quite frankly, here, you probably would get a lot of sunlight on the garage. Uh, you guys have had solar experience at the wharf as well, right? Yeah, our, our apartment built in the, um, around the Anthem actually has a solar array on the roof that we did uh, in, in partnership with Washington Gas Energy Services. So there's different ways to structure it. Um, uh, we actually, we looked at Cogen for a long time. Um, it, it's difficult to s sell electricity across parcel lines, so we ended up with a small Cogen plant that actually powers all the lights in the parking garage. But I think, you know, both of our firms are, are pretty familiar with the newer technologies and things that we can do here to increase the sustainability uh, quotient in the project. Can I ask a question? I just want to follow up. Um, just in terms of the size and scope of that shared garage, um, knowing that we're going to be uh, net zero ready and looking to get into some PPA agreement uh, to have PV arrays on both our middle and our high school, okay. um, what kind of impact do you anticipate that if that uh, parking garage were to go up would have on any kind of potential solar um, capture for us? Yeah, I mean, that, that garage is going to be about the height, if not maybe slightly taller than the buildings across the street. So I don't think you're going to have any, you won't have any shadowing from that building, which is what they really look for. Um, and quite frankly, your, your roofs are far enough away from the hotel and civic uh, venue that you shouldn't have shadowing there as well. Um, and so that, that's something you do pretty quickly and early on, um, the shadowing studies that really tell you what you can do from a solar perspective. You're at the top of the hill, or both of our sites are at the top of the hill, which is helpful as well. So um, I mean, just based on my limited experience, I can't imagine that you would have an issue with that. Um, but that's you know definitely something you want to look at early on in the process, and you need flat, relatively big flat areas, obviously, for it too. You actually flipped to the axon with, mm -hmm. um, with the Henderson graphic. You can see the height of the. Uh, Where is it? The next one. Yeah. There we go. So you can see that height of the garage relative to the uh, the, the school on the right, and the distance right. between the two. So that and you actually see shadows cast from the south. Oh yeah. Um, on those buildings, right. and they're not they're not getting close to the roofs over there. <clears throat> Any more questions from the board? Dr. Noonan? Uh, any closing comments, Mr. Shields? Well, um, I was going to discuss just a little bit about the interim agreement and um, how are we doing on time? 
Go ahead. I think we're okay. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the interim agreement, I'll just say a word about it. Uh, what it principally does is lays out a schedule between now and May. Uh, May 28th is actually the scheduled date for the City Council to consider a land use application for the site as well as a comprehensive agreement. The, um, the school board has a key role in that process. Um, another key step in this process is actually, as was alluded to earlier, have a subdivision plat prepared, um, uh, have the, the school board sign that subdivision plat along with the city and then have that approved by the planning commission. Um, that, uh, that creates the parcel that um, will, you know, will then be subject to this development. We anticipate that that would happen at the same time as the, as the high school site plan will be going through its review by the Planning Commission. Uh, so these design issues are going to drive where that subdivision line is, along with what the school board's goals and objectives are, as well as the city council's. Um, so that's the key thing that the interim agreement does, is lay out that process and that schedule. We did elevate certain key terms in the interim, interim agreement that get to the land transaction. And um, I've got just a, a kind of a two-pager here on s some of those key terms. And I don't know if you know how to get those oh, up on the board. It? Well, I've got a thumb drive in there. But we, we'll just speak off of this. I've got one more version if we can get it up on the screen. But some of the... Um, you know, if we go back to the original objective was to help raise funds to mitigate the impact of the taxpayer to fund the high school. And, um, and the terms do that. We've worked really closely with the city chief financial officer on our debt service projections for the high school. And uh, the bonds plus the future net fiscal impact uh, does um, what we intended it to do initially. So the uh, term of the transaction would be a 99-year ground lease for the majority of the site. There are two residential condo pad sites on the uh, conceptual development plan. Those would be sold fee simple. The rest would be subject to a long-term lease. Um, there's two phases to the development. Phase one is the area that was bounded in that yellow line that uh, we saw earlier. And um, the payments for that total $34.5 million. There's a phase two land payment, which is either $10 million or appraised value at the time that phase two is developed. Um, and so whichever is higher will be the payment to the city. Uh, <clears throat> I tell you what, let's just go off of paper. Yeah. Thank you, John. Um, so those two together have a, a base land value of $44.5 million. In addition, and this is, these are subject to further discussion and study, uh, the shared parking garage option, which you saw tonight, um, if we take that option, um, that would generate an additional $5.3 million. And the reason for that is that the structured parking is lower cost than the underground parking, which would be the other option if the shared uh, parking garage is not what we end up doing. Um, in addition, uh, there's the option of a, creating a community development authority, which would issue bonds uh, for the uh, infrastructure for the 10-acre site. There would be a then a real estate tax applied to that 10-acre site only, not on the rest of the city, but just on that site. And the proceeds from that real estate tax would pay the debt service on the bonds for that infrastructure. Uh, this is a common uh, device that's used throughout the country and in the state of Virginia. We've not done it in the city. We're doing our due diligence on that. But if we choose that option, that would um, increase the value of the transaction by up to $3 million. So those two options together are $8.3 million. In addition, there's a capital event uh, payment that would be for the life of the 99-year lease. And that basically stands for the proposition that each time the property sells or is refinanced, there would be a, a capital event payment to the city of 0.5% um, of the value of that refinancing or the value of that sale. And there are a few clauses attached to that 
but the intent of that is to create a long-term stream of income uh, for the city um, in addition to the, the basic land transaction. The next uh, slide below that has a schedule of the payments that I've just described. And so uh, the first payment uh, for the phase one land payments would be $6.5 million and that would be payable uh, upon execution of the comprehensive agreement in May 2019. And that was a key term in our RFP. It's been difficult for the private sector to meet that term. There's no question about it. There's a cost to that, uh, but it was important to have a really powerful equity payment up front as well as cash for the city so that we could meet debt service for the first two years of that of the bond that we'll be issuing. <clears throat> then there'll be a stream of uh, four payments of $7 million each that would start in 2021 once the high school is completed, the old high school is vacated, and the land is physically conveyed to the development team. So those begin in 2021 and, and go through 2024. The $3 million for the CDA or the $5.3 million for the off-site parking uh, would be payable in year 2021 and year 2023, respectively. Um, phase two, the term for phase two is that uh, that um, payment to the city would be done um, either three years after stabilization of phase one or 2029, whichever date comes sooner. <clears throat> so that's uh, a quick overview of the timing for the land transaction. So things that will be happening um, soon. Uh, we're currently in a, bless you, uh, due diligence period. And uh, that is the period of time that will go through January 15th or thereabouts, January 10th. Um, and that is the time where the developer is going through just to uh, check that all that the, the land is what uh, the developer thinks it is. Um, and um, then after that, there are additional bond payments, performance bonds pay payments. There will be a submittal of a special exception application in late January. That will be referred out in February. And in May is when there will be final consideration of the land use application and the comprehensive agreement. Then after May, between May and 2021, while the high school is uh, being built, um, that is when uh, the development team will go through site plan, get its financing, get its building permits, et cetera. So that's a two-year period to do all those uh, that important work. So I'll stop there to, to see if there are any questions or commentary on this schedule. Okay. Um, so, quick question. Um, why? When does the school board need to make the decision about the shared parking option? Does that need to be made before May 28th? Well, and if so, what information will we have before, to make that decision? Before May um, um, 2019. Um, the, the way I would think of that problem is that it first gets to function and design. That's sort of the first test. Does this work for the school site? Does it work for the 10-acre site? How's the traffic going to flow? How are all these issues going to be resolved? And if there's satisfaction that uh, they will be so resolvable, then we would look for a decision from the school board on that design question. So we'll talk a little bit more about what those steps are. Right now, we're working it at the staff level, and in fact, we've got a meeting of what we call the infrastructure planning group tomorrow, where we'll continue to look at the traffic uh, aspects, the design aspects, um, and then we'll be coming to the school board for recommendations on that. Um, I think it plays into the subdivision, which is a uh, school board action um, as well. And, um, and so I think we, you know, I don't know the exact date by which that decision needs to be made. I will say that the sooner that it can be made, I think the clearer it will be for the public and for all of the design consultants that we have on board. Will we also have um, legal opinions, maybe from the city and from Fairfax County, saying that it's that the parking garage fits within the 3070 or 3070 split? Uh, we certainly need that before okay. uh, May 29th. Just as an input. Can I can I just add um, yeah. we? We added a, at the 
board chair's request this morning a closed session just following this um, with the city manager to answer some of these questions in a little bit more detail too so just fyi any other questions or comments mr anderson thanks why well, quick uh, two quick questions that I wanted to ask about um, the capital event payment terms. You said half a percent of, uh, of what? I'm just trying to figure out to make sure I understand. And was there a difference or anything that associated with the condos since they're fee simple that might be different from, from that? Yeah, and so there is a distinction between the condos and the leasehold. Um, so the capital event fee of a half a percent on the value of the refinancing so okay. or the sale. So it is a gross figure. It's a half a percent of that gross figure, not the profit, not you know a margin, uh, but rather on on the the full value of the transaction. For condos, um, what are uh, the the capital event fee will be 25 basis points or uh, a quarter of a percent, and that would be something that would run with the land, be part of the. Homeowners Association documents that would be filed with that condo uh, regime, and each time an individual condo sells in the future, then there will be that additional uh, increment, and that also would be payable to the city. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Mr. Castillo? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, with respect to all the money that you outlined the the inflows of cash the disposition for all that is for debt service or is there are there other uses that might be considered for some of those flows the uh, intention is for it all to be for to cover our capital program and so the way we have modeled it is you look at the debt service that we need to cover we would use these proceeds as capital reserves, and um, we would draw down those capital reserves to pay debt service. So this cash will sit here in an account, and we will draw down that cash to pay our annual debt service. Ultimately, the net fiscal impact of the project, that's going to take longer to come online, but that should eventually, once the cash is gone, then the net fiscal impact of the project then takes the place of that cash and uh, the taxpayer is there thereby the impact of this of the bond is is not as expensive for the taxpayer um, they, the council has already set aside pennies on the tax rate to build the capital reserves now um, so with this and that was done per the capital plan um, so with that plan there should not be ind additional pennies on the tax rate required for the capital plan um, so, uh, and we're, we're on track. Well, thank you all very much. It was very informative. Good presentation. Good to see. Thank you for making the time to come see us. Uh, we'll now go to the next agenda item, which is a closed meeting. Uh, um, and as the... Um, board knows Mr. Shields will be invited to join us in the closed meeting. Uh, if someone could uh, make a motion, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose, to discuss or consider the identified subject matter, real property under Section 2.2-3711A3 in particular, Disposition of publicly held real property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Castillo. Um, Ms. Goodall, could you call the roll, please? Mr. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Castillo? All right. Ms. Gill? Hi. Ms. Lee? Hi. Mr. Wright? Yes. And yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are now in closed session. Any To reconvene if open. Um, Mr. Anderson. So moved. A second. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. 
And if someone could certify the closed meeting. Mr. Chairman, whereas the Falls Church City Public School Board has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to the affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and whereas Section 2.23711B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church Public School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you, Ms. Ranger. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Castillo. I'm Ms. Goodell. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Castillo? Yeah, I... Ms. Gill? Ms. Litton? Mr. Wright here? <laughs> yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. And Mr. Webb? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yay! <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to the work session in 5.01, Principles, Goals, and Action Plans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to invite up to the table our um, esteemed leaders of our schools. Uh, we've got Rachel Hamburger from Jesse Thackeray Preschool. We've got Tim Kasich from Mount Daniel Elementary. Uh, we've got Paul Swanson from Thomas Jefferson. Valerie Hardy from Mary Ellen Henderson and Matt Hills from the high school. Um, tonight, they uh, were invited to share with you uh, very briefly some samplings of some of the goal work that they've uh, achieved and I think uh, there's a couple of things before I turn it over to them that I th are worthy of sort of mentioning. Um, one is, as I've mentioned previously and uh, when we had our operational folks come to the table as well, uh, one of the things I was hoping that you would notice is that there's alignment, right? From school board to superintendent, superintendent to assistant superintendents to leadership to buildings to classrooms to students and, and then back up uh, as well. And so this evening, um, my hope is that you'll see some of that very similar alignment uh, as they share their goals, as they talk about uh, deploying best practices for teaching, learning, and operations, closing the achievement gap, um, and then ensuring operational effectiveness and efficiency. Um, the real value, uh, however, <laughs> to their goals are the work plans that are behind them. And while these are words on paper, that may leave you wondering, well, what does this mean? Or how does this actually work? Um, one piece that I think is extraordinarily valuable is um, seeing the work plans that go behind it. And tonight what you'll hear is, um, while they've developed these goals, they have developed some pretty significant work plans that were uh, products of not these folks at the table, but the folks that they worked with in their schools. So. Um, for the first time in a while, um, our schools developed action plans and they were our instructional teams at each of the schools that were doing that work. So I don't want to take too much of their thunder, but I do want to make sure that you understand as a board that what you're seeing tonight is really an outcome of broad, a broad group of people at each of the schools developing these work plans that represent just a, f a few words on a page, if that makes any sense. So um, with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to turn it over, and um, we are going to go from youngest to oldest today, Ms. Hamburger. So uh, we'd like to welcome Rachel Hamburger, our uh, esteemed leader at Jesse Thackeray Preschool, to talk a little bit about uh, what she's been working on. So we met with the professional staff at JTP and um, looked at the placemat and the division goals and then decided how that would sort of align with our goals for the school. There were some, um, the focus at JTP has often been on the special ed kids. So we looked at the ELL kids, for, exa for example, um, for our second goal for closing achievement gaps. and. We also needed a process um, for behavior concerns for our typical kids and how we were going to follow that process so that we pulled in the MTSS piece and looked at the resources we have in the division, which has been really a helpful thing and we are really working with the resources within the division.
And so the way this translated to our work at Mount Daniel was um, we, we convened a team of um, teachers, both classroom teachers, specialists, paraprofessionals, um, school counselor, um, school administration, and we took a, a deep dive into the, the placemat and we, we looked at the school goals uh, or the division-wide goals especially and said, how does this translate to what we're trying to accomplish here at Mount Daniel? Um, that working group then split into three small, smaller subgroups and each group was kind of tasked with coming up with a goal or a, a school goal for the division goals. So after after meeting and discussing and coming up with the goals and, and work plans for, uh, for each one of those, we came back together uh, and explained our process that we went through and the discussion that we went through and, and our decision making process as to how we uh, came up with these plans. In turn, that committee, that large committee, then went out to the rest of the school and shared the information with their with their respective teams or departments. They get they were tasked with getting feedback around those goals, and then we reconvened again as a smaller committee to take the feedback that came from the staff and kind of refine what the work that we wanted to do. Um, where I'm especially proud of the work for Mount Daniel, though, is really in that, that goal number three, is designing structures and opportunities to collaborate within grade level departments. Um, what, what that really kind of goes deep into, though, is the, the change in culture that's going to be happening soon at Mount Daniel with the arrival of the second grade team and the related staff. So a lot of the work um, around that will be done, or hopefully be done, um, very deliberately at this at the school level so that when those teachers are absorbed into the staff at Mount Daniel it's a smooth transition so as um, Rachel and Tim described I think one of the things that we're really proud of at TJ is not just the outcome but the process that we used and one of the things that we did is that we started by looking at the placemat and then trying to make some really concise interpretations about what does this mean for our work at TJ and we ended up sort of breaking things down into four areas literacy instruction numeracy instruction PYP and then social and emotional offerings and from there we had instructional specialists create essentially a presentation on the state of TJ and where are we with literacy where are we with numeracy and so on so we created data sheets that were shared across the entire building and a lot of that data then really led to some of these goals for instance one of the things that was was jarring for us was our PYP operations and our new PYP coordinator thank you thank you thank you for <laughs> funding that by the way um, administered a survey and it was pretty impactful and one of the things that we discovered is that when you look at our staff when asked whether or not you believe that PYP and the IB framework is really healthy for kids well over 80 percent of our staff responded in the highest affirmative at the same time when asked to what extent do you feel comfortable implementing the elements of PYP in your classroom on a daily basis only 27 percent of staff members said that they felt really confident so that becomes in a division that is striving to be the premier IB division that becomes really a pretty urgent red flag for us so when we looked at this data sheet instructional leadership as well as team leaders all played a role in <coughs> carving out not only the the goals but then also the inputs to those what are the strategies that we're going to use how are we going to leverage early release Wednesdays and collaborative team times in order to get to that number regarding PYP how are we going to minister to the fact that we're four points underwater relative to math scores and leap performance compared to state average so I think there's been a lot of good work that has been done and one of the things that Valerie said when we were just talking about this loosely that I think is probably true in all of our buildings that is maybe the highest testimony to the work that's been done is I really believe that if you went into any one of our buildings and if you just picked a teacher at random and asked them what goals are you working on this year they'd be able to tell you mm -hmm. they would know it exactly and that's that's a pretty good day's work 
Well, I guess I'm done because um, Paul just said everything I was going to say. <laughs> um, but I think our, our journeys are all very similar in this, this, um, a, this really strong sense of getting stakeholder input at multiple levels. Um, what was exciting about our journey is this actually was a two-year journey, my first year coming in, right, taking that triennial plan and unpacking that. Um, and also being new, it gave a great opportunity to get insight and perspective on the work that had been done, the alignment to where it needed to go. And then when we were um, given uh, the actual placemat, right, for us that was like, oh, this is great, right, educators speak. It all aligned with the work we had done. So our approach to this has actually been um, whole school. So we used faculty meetings um, throughout the year to get everyone's input. So it wasn't just a leadership team, it was everyone. Um, so staff was able to sort of identify the areas that they felt they either had the most um, insight to offer, things they're doing well, or areas where they thought they could give some collaborative input to help drive those strategies, um, and then really dug deeply into our data and created those goals. Um, and what was great about that is between Dr. Dippold, myself, and then now um, Ms. Miller, our NYP coordinator, um, we each were able to kind of help lead each one of those respective goal groups. Um, and the last part of the process was giving everyone an opportunity to see the work that the other two goals did. Does that make sense? So they focused deeply on one, but they still needed to kind of see and have ownership and input um, in a way to reflect on the other two. Um, so that was awesome because it led to this. And honestly, we felt like we were so hands off in the process because this is their work. Um, but we wanted to be strategic about our needs, right? So that first goal, again, very much um, like my colleagues here have said, if we're gonna be the premier IB school system, then how are we doing that intentionally? And for us, it's unpacking and really walking through explicitly that MYP planner and really refining and reflecting. Because in the busyness of life as a teacher, it, and we just don't have enough time, right? And so we wanted to be intentional about that and getting that feedback from colleagues and our MYP coordinator so that we can make sure that as we go through the other units, we've got a good and healthy model. The second um, is our area where we know we need to have um, some growth. Um, it's where we have a VDOE indicator that's, um, that's a little not where we need it to be. So we're intentional and strategic and determined to um, get that where it needs to be, and that is the goal because that's where we have to go. Um, and then the last was looking at um, all of the awesome things that we have done over the years to create systems of intervention and support around academics we needed to sort of align that to behavior. And um, we don't have huge behavior problems, but when we look at our data and disaggregate it, that's the area where we had the highest number of referrals, and so trying to reduce that in a, just as a strategic way as we do with our um, academics was really the thought behind goal three and aligning that to our similar processes. So. So as my colleagues just described, really one of the most powerful components is the pre-K through 12 alignment piece and the connections that exist. Um, and really when you talk about those connections, when you're working with students and when you're working with staff, this does answer the why. And I think that is really such an important piece to recognize when we're working within our collaborative teams and with our instructional leadership teams to determine the next direction and where we want to go. That you can look back and say, oh my goodness, oh my goodness this is what's happening at Mary, Mary Ellen Henderson and this is what's happening at the preschool and they're all connected. So that, that really is powerful for me and those are part of the conversations that we've had within our groups. One of the things we really wanted to focus on at George Mason is, you know, we talk about empowering our teachers and our faculty all the time. What does that mean? What does that look like? And here was an opportunity, instead of telling them what our goals were, for them to work within their particular collaborative teams. And we kind of used a backwards design. So we have this instructional placemat as our framework. And we used it, and we used it accordingly to guide them. But what we did was we asked our teachers to work within their departments. Uh, to really come up with what they believe is their work and a common goal. And then from there, at the high school, we have a structure where we have discipline-based teams. So uh, let's say our English department met, they came up with one goal, and then the English 9 team, they came up with another goal. And from there, we took all of that data, and we as an instructional leadership team decided what our school-wide goals were going to be. 
and as I mentioned, they were aligned with, with the other schools. And I thought that was really powerful when we sat down with all of the staff and talked through the why. I think it answered that, and it gave them a sense to really lead the charge on what our goals would be at George Mason. And I think that was the ultimate goal. Thank you all very much. Did you have anything to add before I ask if there are questions? Um, are there any questions for our uh, big, great group of panelists here tonight from our schools? Ms. Russell? So I just had a, first of all, I want to say thank you. And this is fantastic. And I think it really clearly outlines what everyone's working on. And I think um, it definitely ties all the schools together. So I think that's wonderful. But I guess the one question I had was for Mr. Swanson with regard to your first school and then 90% of teachers feeling more comfortable. And I was just curious, like, why not 100%? Because if I feel completely uncomfortable and I even move that needle like 1%, I would think that's more comfortable. And so I'm just curious. Yeah, we, we actually talked about that. Um, and I think there's two things. First of all, I think even among the instructional leadership team, there was a little bit of hesitation in making a goal that surrounded how people feel. That just seems kind of hazy. But again, the reason for that is that when you look at only 27% of our staff, uh, and I should probably talk about that a little bit, 27% of our staff reported feeling confident implementing the elements of PYP in their instruction on a daily basis to go from 27 to 100 percent in one year it is pretty ambitious even 90 percent may be a little ambitious but I guess you know that's the thing is that there are two different measurements so the one is more comfortable and so I think there's a big difference between feeling more comfortable I could feel like you know the concept makes me want to just cry and move to like I actually am willing to give it a shot that's more comfortable versus like what you were measuring being you know feeling confident um, so I can understand but it just seems like there are two different metrics from what you measured to what your goal is yeah so the yeah the precise wording is comfortable more comfortable um, and the reason we took that exactly word for word from a survey that our PYP coordinator administered to TJ and Mount Daniel Hence the wording. Other questions? Mr. Castillo? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you all for coming out tonight. One question with respect to other IB school divisions, have we had or have you had any conversations with colleagues or peers there about what they're doing in some ways that could help us? digest IB and that'll be question one. I'll, I'll jump in on that. I know last year um, Matt and I actually had an opportunity to go with Miss High and we um, took our previous NYP coordinator um, as well as a teacher with us to um, actually visit a different IB school so we could get some ideas around just how they're structured, um, looking at assessment, looking at how they're reporting with grading, just so we could start to get our heads around some of our next steps that were given as recommendations um, from our, our most recent evaluation, just sort of that planning ahead. Um, and I think that was very insightful and helpful <laughs> um, for the two of us. Um, and it's also been helpful as we've gone out to um, IB trainings to build some networking that way and meeting some um, other Virginia schools that have started this work too and trying to gauge where they are in the journey so that we can try to see are there places where we can maybe share resources um, and learn some different ways to either do some of our crosswalks or um, how they're approaching the grading question, right? Um, so yes, to answer your question, I think that's been um, helpful in those opportunities when we are able to do that. Uh, at the high school, we also had an opportunity to visit right down the road Marshall. Uh, when we think about you know full implementation of the IB curriculum, especially at the 11th and 12th grade level, we um, noticed that Marshall, their English department, is running something similar to that. They still have 
you know, several classes that are a little bit outside the world of, of IB, but we talked about the transition to that, what it looks like, what it means, you know, some of their goals related to the work of IB, uh, and making sure that all students have access to that curriculum, and I think that's always been a piece of what we're trying to do at the high school. Uh, so we're constantly having conversations with them. You know, I think the, the visit to, to DCI last year was extremely helpful, and, you know, though they are a charter school, uh, and it's a little bit different in terms of what they do over there, I think it was helpful to kind of see some of their structures in place because mm -hmm. that's something we, we do need to focus on where we are you know oftentimes considering different structures to allow for what you know our goals are in terms of being a full IB implemented program so so just one other question if I may so uh, it's interesting to look at how these <coughs> things break down there's a little bit of scores and improving scores and addressing areas for growth um, what, what I think is is also noteworthy is there are a few boxes of, that talk about collaboration you know within the ranks of the, the teachers and professionals and and how that dovetails with with IB so how, how so there's the 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 teacher student interaction but then there's also the internal collaboration piece and I was wondering if you could talk about how big a role the collaboration piece is in in your goals and, and in the process going forward? So I'll start off with that one. That's a really good question. Um, one of the things that we're always trying to do is find time, more time for teachers to collaborate and, and, and build opportunities for teachers to uh, work together in structured ways so that they can look at the PYP units of study or the planners um, and make sure that they're being implemented um, correctly and that they have time to reflect on the learning afterward. Um, one of the challenges though is you know having limited number of minutes in a day and so many things that we have to do. So I know for, for Mount Daniel speaking for me um, and my staff that is one of the things that we really wanted to be deliberate about in moving forward so that we can address um, our, our kind of division vision of being the premier IB division. I think when you consider, um, and I have in, in one of my goals, the idea of code of collaboration, how important it is, as Tim mentioned, reflecting on the learning, taking time to be able to adjust, uh, to interpret the assessment data, uh, it's such an important piece to what our teachers are doing, you know, especially at the high school level when you're talking about four or five teachers teaching the same subject area and using the MYP and the DP framework to make sure that the students are getting what they need out of every single assignment, every single assessment. Uh, and the reflection piece is, is huge. Uh, it takes a lot of time to, to, to break down uh, what it is that they're going over, including the data. And I think you know, providing them the adequate amount of time in order to do that is important and it's key. But I think that's why you see uh, the reoccurring theme of collaboration across the board at all schools. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I think has really kind of transitioned us over the last few years in terms of it being a priority. Uh, we're going to make sure that we're aligned. We're, we're not going to be working in our silos. We're going to be doing everything uh, together to make sure that our students achieve. It, it really is a great question, Mr. Castillo, because there's a lot of things that are coming together here. For instance, you earlier asked, what have other schools in our neighborhood, what have they done? And at least at the elementary level, one of the things that we saw is that we saw te or we saw schools that had really allotted a lot more time for not only what are we going to do, but also what did we just do, and that reflection piece that Matt had talked about. So I think that for us, that has directly led to a revamp of some of our PD and our CT times already this year, and how much time we're allocating to PYP. I think it's critical to how we do the work, right? And it values to the expertise in the room. Mm -hmm. And if we give the platform for teachers to kind of function this way, I think they are feeling to that sense of, you said earlier, Matt, empowerment, right? How we are going to meet these goals is through all of us kind of seeing how we all interconnect. That's very IB, right? Mm -hmm. And so that has been incredibly powerful and I think um, connecting to, I think, the bigger placemat, right, and, st and strategic plans um, that we all have. Uh, but I think it's also uh, noteworthy, I think it's led to this collaboration 
too, right? I think it's led us to, to being more intentional. Um, I think Matt and I sort of jokingly say it's like the marriage, right? NYP bridges our buildings, but it also has led us to even thinking about when we build our master schedules, how can we get some of our subject areas? It might be hard to do, but that even has to become a factor, right? But that's good for us to be thinking that way and working together. And this goal for us was one that our teachers felt very strongly about. It was actually the first goal that they came up with, the collaboration. And um, we created sort of a format so all the teams were collaborating with each other, but they could also collaborate across teams. And in fact, they're going to do walkthroughs in January to see each other teaching and have certain look fors that they're going to have to improve their practice and continue on that inquiry based curriculum that we're using um, that ties right into the PYP. Mm -hmm. Mr. Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks very much for, for coming out and presenting this to us. I, I found this really fascinating. And I'm wondering about um, how or has there been thought about uh, talking with the, with the parents, with the community, about how this works both tied into the into the triennial plan, tied into the overall place map, but also at each of the schools. Like, I don't know if this is going to be part of the parent coffees or these sorts of things. I'm curious what your plans are for that. So we just hosted a parent coffee a couple weeks ago, and PYP was the topic. So Carrie Checa, who is the PYP coordinator for us and for Mount Daniel and Thomas Jefferson, uh, gave the presentation. Um, we were scheduled for 45 minutes. She actually went for about an hour and 15 um, in the morning session and in the evening session because the, the questions that the community had were, were really good, and, and the time was well spent answering those questions. Um, and and to, to go back a little bit, too, as far as, like, are we talking to other folks about what they've done at other buildings? We have a great internal resource now with Carrie Checa, who is a former PYP principal um, from a charter school in California. So she's been able to share a lot with us. We've already learned so much from her. Um, so I just wanted to throw that piece in too. Um, but yeah, the, the principal coffee has definitely been um, a, a success and it was a great way to get this information out. Um, the anecdotal feedback that I got was that it was the best one of the year so far. So. I'm going to invite Carrie back again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I guess I'll just uh, put a plug in for, I don't know if it's a future in Gen Item, but I, can we invite you to come back and tell us how it's going later on? I want to see, I'd like to hear more about this as time progresses. We can definitely do that. Uh, it's always good to hear from them anyways about where they are in the process. Uh, just to sort of th add into that, you know, one of the nice things that uh, we've been able to say this this year for the first time is that their goals are our goals and our goals are their goals. So as they do the really hard work and the heavy lift in the schools that really support all of our division-wide work, um, ultimately that will support the school board's goals as well. So uh, absolutely we'll continue to provide feedback um, about how things are going. Mr. Reininger. Thank you. I'd like to echo my thanks. I guess this is more of a comment than a question, but it, it kind of feels to me like this needs to be two documents rather than one. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> there's a mixture here of outputs and outcomes, some measurable, some not. And in some cases, the blocks are what people are doing, and the other it's the metric of what you're actually trying to achieve. So you know, there's some very clear, smart goals up here. And then there are some other boxes that are more, we're trying to do X, Y, and Z, or we're establishing a process. Um, and it's just a, it's a little difficult for me to do cross comparisons with those different ways of approaching it. I mean, ideally, I'd like to be able to, you know, see one block on um, what you're doing, what your strategy is, and then what the metric associated with that is. Because there's some really awesome metrics up here, you know. Um, the Thomas Jefferson, by the end of 18 to 19, the TJES, SOL, math, pass rate will meet or exceed state average. You did that or you didn't do it, right? You, it's laying it out there, this is what the goal is. And some of the blocks do that, some don't. But then you, know, you can lose some of the, the texture about what's happening if it's just that. So I love scorecards, but I'd, kind of, I'd like to be able to have both a strategy and a scorecard for each of the, the block pieces, recognizing that it is an action plan. So. Thank you. Great work. And it's fun to see all this. I would echo what Mr. Anderson says about um, we should invite you all back. And at the end of the year, 
you know, go through each of the blocks and we could say, did you do that? How did you end up? You know, how could we be more helpful to you for that to be more successful as we go forward? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, if not, thank you all very much. And as you hear, look forward to having you back here in a few months to talk a little bit about some of the successes that you all have had. Uh, thank you all very much. Thanks, guys. Uh, next up will be the FY19 monthly budget update. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to actually uh, turn this over to Ms. Michael for her very easy to do monthly financial plan. in dollars and percentage oh. <laughs> for the revenue when we look at the revenue on this chart the available budget represents the revenue um, the budgeted revenue that's not yet received and for the expenditures it represents the budget not yet expended so when we look at this chart um, following this slide you'll see on the next two pages we have a little bit more detail summary that has a three-year comparison for both revenue and expenditures and page three shows a graph of each of those as well um, so for this month when we look at our revenue and expenditures we're really tracking as we projected um, we'll continue to use this data and refine it's been really helpful as we've been developing the proposed budget particularly as we've been reviewing our salaries and benefits um, both of which are tracking consistently in pr with prior years but it's been very helpful to have this data as we develop the next year's budget so unless there are any questions this is the monthly budget report um, through November questions mr. Reininger thank you Ms. Michael one thing I I noticed in looking at this report which appears to be true for past reports as well is that um, generally, although it's um, more significant this year than two years ago, less significant than last year, um, benefits as a percentage of expenditure are under running salaries. Um, and I was just wondering, because, you know, without knowing the background, you would think they'd sort of burn at the same rate. And I'm wondering if that means that the benefits expenditures are kind of coming in below forecast or salaries coming in above the forecast? It's an absolutely excellent question um, because you're actually right. When we look at our largest expenditures for salaries, teacher salaries, to date there's 75 percent available, which makes exact sense. We've paid the first quarter payments. We've paid teachers in this report in September, October, November. So three months you would exactly think that we have 75 percent left. So when we look at ex uh, expenditures for benefits, we have two types of benefits. We have salary sensitive benefits. So when we think of those, they would include things like retirement, life insurance, FICA is also salary sensitive. Those should be expending at the exact same rate as salaries. But when we look at things like health insurance, because our health insurance isn't a salary sensitive benefit, right, and because people change plans during the year, we do see some fluctuation there. So for example, our health plan election runs from July to July, um, but in this region, many people's plans run from January to January, right? So right now we're processing changes for pe many people whose um, other person in their household works for the federal government or another employer who uses that. Um, but you're, you're, you're right, benefits are definitely spending a little bit slower than salaries, um, you know, which in the end is, is undoubtedly we're going to have a little bit more money that will fall out of benefits and salaries. What we've done when we look at the budget for next year, 
Right, as we really go back and kind of start over when we look at those benefits. When we think of benefits for retirement, FICA, all of those salary sensitive things, they're all recalculated on the new salary base. And then we also look at health insurance based on what our current practice is in terms of the average plan and what people are picking. Thank you. I just, you know, whether, whether benefits is, are salary sensitive or not, um, I would think that they'd still run at the same rate so I mean, the same rate as salary right so if it's if it's a yeah. it would be it would chronological as opposed to as opposed to changing well we yeah i thought of one other thing that's kind of a nuance to this when you look at teachers which are our largest category of employee teachers actually pay their contributions to the virginia retirement system over 10 months instead of 12 months versus our contributions for things like FICA are over 12 months. So that's also impacting this calculation. That, so I, that, that's a perfectly reasonable explanation. It would just be, it would be good to know for sure why it's underrunning to see if we need to do some slightly different measures of forecasting benefits for the future so we can have a more accurate budget forecast. But that, it could very well be that. That makes eminent sense. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much, Ms. Michael. And next up, um, before we go to the next part, I am going to defer to Mr. Anderson for a disclosure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're going to start the cycle of uh, budget disclosures. Um, I have consulted with the school board attorney and am making the following disclosure of interest pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3112B1. Pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3115H, I have a personal interest in the school board budget in that my spouse is an employee of the Falls Church City School Board and therefore I'm a member of a group of three or more persons affected by budget decisions. I am able to participate in our discussions fairly objectively and in the public interest. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, we will move on to FY20 budget discussion. Dr. Noonan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this evening, uh, what, I'd, what we've prepared for you um, is um, an update of kind of where we uh, believe we are with respect to the budget guidance that we've received from the City Council, um, some general conversations that we've had not only with you, um, but also with some of our employee groups and um, sort of how we can see and craft a path forward given the current budget guidance that we've been given um, by the City Council, which is at 2% um, or organic revenues, um, whichever is, is greater. Um, so I want to um, I want to just start by running through a couple of slides just as a, a pre uh, pr just kind of going back over and, and reviewing some information that we've shared with you previously and then we'll get into a little bit more detail around where we are but in the abstract um, our focus this year uh, from a from a needs-based perspective is really not rooted in more programmatic kinds of needs um, but more around making sure that we compensate this the the people that we have that care for our kids daily in a really um, positive way that does a couple of things one is supports us in the recruitment of teachers given the very competitive nature of northern the northern virginia region southern maryland region um, also allows us to uh, substantively retain people as they can see themselves sort of growing through the system um, and and ultimately um, sharing in the uh, the notion of these are some of our most valued valued people in our community or those that really care for our kids on a day in and day out basis so that sort of is, has been the context or backdrop that we've been working from from the perspective of this this year's budget so with that just sort of in the in the background let me just share with you a couple of slides you've seen these before the first is um, just our FY19 budget overview just to give you a sense of where does our revenue come from and in this slide you'll see that 83 percent of our revenue to uh, the city of Falls Church Schools comes from the general government the state provides us about 13 percent which is the second largest uh, contributor to our revenue and then uh, fees and others are 2% and then we have some reserves and about 1% of our overall budget comes from uh, federal, federal funding. 
Our expenditures, however, on the other hand, are um, all people um, to the tune of 80, about 85 percent of our expenditures in the system are on people and about 13 percent are logistics and then we have, we maintain about a 1 percent transfer uh, and reserves account. As a strong fiscal uh, policy in indicator, we want to make sure that we maintain some reserve uh, four times when, uh, when we need them. Uh, just a reminder about our enrollment projections. Um, those are, of course, pr uh, performed for us or, and provided for us by the Cooper Center at the University of Virginia. Um, that center also prepares the projections for the state, and the states use that projection data um, to allocate their sales taxes uh, to all of the school divisions. So it is a validated um, and, and positive process that they go through. There are some information and inputs that I've, uh, that we've indicated in the slide we've gone through before, but uh, primarily it's about birth data, um, looking at current age and specific fertility rates of regions, um, and then historical and current fall membership counts. And that is, that second piece is really important to us in the context of the conversation that we're going to have tonight and I think going forward. Uh, because if you look at our projections for FY20 in the future years, um, the, top, the top chart indicates what the enrollment uh, projections were for 18-19 uh, and projects out to 23-24. Uh, so you'll see that the projections for this year were 26-29 uh, and, and our FY 2020 projection from Weldon Cooper is 26.99, um, and that indicates a, a growth over what our current enrollment of 26.45 is by 54 students. So, according to Weldon Cooper, we should anticipate that we were that we will grow by about 54 students between this year and and next year. Little information about the projection history and its accuracy, just as a review. Um, the blue line is the projected and the orange line is the actuals. Uh, and for the last two years, we have come in slightly under projection. Um, two years ago in FY18, we came in at 97.8%. This year, we came in at 96.5%. Um, and again, you'll see that uptick on the blue line, which is, accounts for about 54 more students, and that's where we anticipate we will be um, next year. This is an important line graph to share with you um, because if you track back to FY 2018 and where, we're, where our actuals came in um, and where we're projected to be in FY 20, just on a purely um, draw across with a straight line, you'll see that we are projected to be at about where our, where our actuals were in about FY 18. That's important, it's an important conceptual understanding to have because when we think about growing program and we think about growing enrollments and we think about growing teacher, faculty and the like, um, the truth is in FY18, we, we had the staff and have the staff currently to handle the number of students that we anticipate in growth for FY20, which means that in this budget uh, cycle, I don't anticipate that we are going to add any teachers to our budget uh, and that we aren't going to add any real programmatic changes in our budget either. I think that we are set uh, with the, the teachers that we have and may actually, uh, through an efficiency and an effectiveness lens, be able to um, find some efficiencies that may actually help the budget moving forward. With respect to the students we're serving, and this is where the rub is, we may, we may be very similar in size from 2018 to 2020, but the, the rub is that we are um, seeing some changes in the types of students that we're serving. So, for example, um, this year, two years ago over this past year, um, we grew by 28 students in our LEAP program. That's a growth of about 12%. Um, we grew by 23 students in our economically disadvantaged uh, category. That's a growth of about 11 percent. And our students with special needs grew from 365 to 388, which is 23 more students, which is about a 6 percent growth. So overall, um, the, we grew um, 
in total across the division, 28 students. However, if you look at the 28 in LEAP, the 23 in economically disadvantaged, and the 23 in special education, you'll note that that's significantly greater than the 28 overall population that we grew. So we are serving more students that have unique needs than we've served in the past. Now, one of the things that I think is important to contemplate in this chart is that there are some students that are in maybe two categories, and maybe even in some cases all three categories. You might have a LEAP student who's also economically disadvantaged and special needs. However, one of the things that I want to make sure that everyone understands is that each of these um, categories indicates a service that we're providing to those students. So, for example, if you're a LEAP student, we're providing you a LEAP service. If you're a student who's economically disadvantaged, we're supporting you with um, free and reduced lunch. If you are a student who has special needs, you're also getting an, an IEP. So those are three unique services that may be the same student. So it's not as though duplicated counts really is impactful um, as, it, as it could be in other, um, other areas. So the cost uh, per pupil comparison in the WABY guide, which we've shown before, we're the fourth uh, bar, uh, set of bars to the, from the left. Um, you'll note that we are um, consistently among uh, the highest cost per pupil, and that is driven primarily by um, the, the school board's um, defined policy around class size. We do maintain our class sizes at a very small number in comparison to our counterparts around the region. So that does drive up that per pupil cost. Um, and so nothing you're going to hear from me tonight will indicate that we want to substantively change or change at all the um, this class size, for example, and, and I'll share with you kind of where we're going with that. So some of the budget drivers that we are, <coughs> we've shared with you before that are part of our process are salary, um, and, and the first piece is um, a step increase. So those teachers that have been with us for, say, five years may be on step five or, or step four because we didn't have a step last year. So to move from step four to step five um, costs money. Um, and if we do that across the system, based on the population of teachers that we have today, and we've gone salary file by salary file to look at it, the overall cost for us if we maintain the same teacher core that we have today is about $1.1 million. In addition, uh, cost of living allowance for our teachers for every 1% represents a $400,000 increase. So if we wanted to do a, a step increase and a 1% COLA, for example, um, we would be looking at about $1.5 million. We would like to take a look at substitute pay. This has been something that's been on the radar um, of, our, of us for a number of, uh, a, a number of months anyway, uh, since I've arrived anyway, years, two years now. Um, we are uh, and have done the analysis of the surrounding jurisdictions and have identified that we are um, not as, we're not the lowest paid substitute area in the region, but we're certainly not the highest. So we would like to become more competitive. And for us, uh, in a, a comprehensive, fully needs-based budget, uh, we would look to increase the substitute pay by $50,000. <coughs> we are anticipating a growth uh, in benefits um, of about 10% this year. And so looking at a 10% increase in health, health insurance, we're looking at about a $315,000 bump. We know that there are going to be a couple of other cost drivers that are unknown to us right now. Uh, so for example, movement of second grade to Mount Daniel. We did meet with the two principals today to begin the conversation um, about what, what the planning process is going to be moving forward. Um, and we are going to work diligently to do that as cost neutrally as possible. Um, but we do know that there are going to be some costs that are associated with that to make that move. Uh, there will be some other um, supports for students that we may want to look at, social workers, behavior support, parent liaisons, et cetera, and then any increase in cost for materials, supplies, and services. So um, if, if I were, and let me, let me back up, if I were going to come to you and say, um, here, is what, here is what we need, um, I, would, I would say to you that I would, I would be really excited to be able to do a step increase for all of our employees. I would be really excited to do a 1% cost of living allowance and adjustment for all of our employees because it not only 
allows our staff to step, but it also grows the salary scale, which is uh, really a powerful tool for us when we are recruiting and retaining teachers, um, particularly in this region. Um, I, I would say to you that we would need to pay the health care um, benefits additional cost, which is you know a contractual obligation we have, and we would like to spend fifty thousand dollars on um, infusing into the substitute pay to look at how we may be, be able to create some parity in the region. However, <laughs> let me let me show you this next slide, um, and this is where we begin to see sort of the disparity among and between what the budget, budget guidance is. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Dr. Noonan, just, just before you get into this piece, um, in terms of the budget cost drivers, one of the things I just want to make sure you've ad addressed, because you, you raised it earlier about student services and the fact that we've seen a change in the growth of the population and that means more needs. D does, do the effects of that show up here in the budget drivers? They show up in our staff realignment line, um, and we'll talk more about that when we get to um, that next page, but it's a good question. So, so moving ahead, um, this is where we begin to see um, the disparity between what the budget guidance is and what some of our cost drivers are. Um, and what we've prepared in this slide is just to give you a sense of the general government um, and their cost drivers, because they are also pressed with some significant cost drivers going forward, and our cost drivers. So if you look at the left-hand column, you will see um, that if we, we take the 2% projected revenue growth um, in the city, that's about $1.7 million, which would be, if we split that 50-50, about $850,000 to the general government and about $850,000 to the schools. The revenue available uh, for the schools increases by about $85,000 in state revenue, and we'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes because we, we don't have an update necessarily from um, the, the governor's proposal, but we have a sense of where we may be headed. Um, but if you take the 85000 which is based on a prior number that we had, that means that our general revenue that we have available to fund our budget is $935,000. Back over to the general government side, general government has a WMATA obligation of $400,000 that they need to take care of. And they've agreed to pick that up 100% and own that, which means that their um, overall amount that they have to work with then drops to about $450,000 compared to the $935,000 that we have in revenue to work from. If the general government provides a 3% COLA, um, and, and we provide a step and a 1% COLA, you see what those numbers are. So you, you see on the general government side, 3% uh, COLA will cost the general government about $600,000, and for us to do a COLA and a step, it would cost us about $1.5 million. We believe that there's going to be about $185,000 in savings from position turnover, so when I said to you that the $1.1 million in step is based on today's actual budgeted positions, we anticipate that there may be, and there always is, some turnover in positions, and we may be able to capture some savings. For example, if we have a, a retired teacher goes out, that teacher isn't going to get a step or a COLA, and we hire a newer teacher that new teacher is going to come in at a reduced cost. It may be on the margin, uh, it may not be, but we anticipate about $185,000 in savings from that change. We would then recognize $50,000 for the pay adjustment on the, on the school side. The health insurance cost for the general government is $200,000. We've modified ours to about $300,000 here, <coughs> which shows then the general government expenditure obligations are about $1.2 million, and their projected gap is about $350,000, and our projected expenditure increase would be about $1.665 million, which would leave us a gap of about $730,000. I think it's important just for context to understand that we both come into this with sort of a, in a one-down position, because we have not seen the growth that we, I think, had hoped for with respect to 
um, overall revenue. Now, there's a couple of other things that I want to just sort of comment on on this before I go on to the next slide, and that is that um, we have um, an agreement with the city. The, the city manager has agreed that if WMATA comes in anywhere less than three hundred thousand dollars, that that de decrease a portion of that would come back and be shared with the schools. So let's say that WMATA came in at two hundred thousand instead of four hundred thousand. <clears throat> Two hundred to three hundred is a hundred thousand dollars, so we would then share fifty thousand dollars each. Additionally, um, that two percent projected revenue increase, if that were also to increase, we would then work with the city manager and we would share that uh, increase in revenue as well. So there are some opportunities in this gap of seven hundred and thirty thousand to actually come down. One other great opportunity that we see where that 730 could be reduced would be the $85,000 in state revenue that was recognized in this budget. <coughs> Today, uh, the governor announced his budget, and Kristen has some information for us that she can share. We just pulled the sheets off at about 6.55, right before the meeting started. Exactly right before the meeting started. So I'll do my best to summarize it. I'll start with the dollar total impact to us and then just talk about some of the details. So in total, when we look at what the governor's proposal means to, to us as compared to what we had from last year's state adopted budget, um, it appears that we would receive about $145,000 more than the $85,000 that we budgeted. But before we get too excited about that $145,000, it really falls into two broad categories. The first is $65,000 in funding, which is from a compensation supplement that I'll talk about in just a minute. But the other larger category of overall revenue increase, just looking at the very largest numbers, is $88,000 in special education regional tuition. Right, And there's no details about that in the governor's proposal in terms of those strings. So we have to first see if we would qualify for all of that funding and how it could be used. So absent that, there is $65,000 from the compensation supplement. So just a little bit on the governor's budget proposal overall. Um, on a statewide basis overall for the state, they're projecting 9,607 students less um, for 2020 than they had in their original projections. So I thought that was just an interesting note that I would share. Um, when they look at sales tax revenue as well, the revised sales tax revenue projections are projected to come in higher, 44.5 million higher in 2020 than they had projected. That also on the surface sounds like super great news for us, um, but when you look at sales tax projections, they update those with the Weldon Cooper July 1, 2017 school age population estimates and then they allocate state aid based on your percentage of students in the state. So when I look at what they're projecting for us for 2020 for sales tax, it's actually $7,056 lower than the previous projection. So while statewide sales tax is going up, our percentage of that total pie um, resulted in us ending up with that slight decrease. So the largest source of funding, the compensation supplement, um, that's something the governor had released earlier this week and we were really waiting to see what the strings would be for that. Um, so the language I was very pleased to see today says um, that we have to certify to the Virginia Department of Education that salary increases of a minimum average of 5% have been or will have been provided to instructional and support personnel during the 2018-2020 biennium, either in the first year the second year or a combination of the two years. So for us, that's very good news. We were worried that we would have to provide all of the 5% in one year, um, which you could see based on our proposal here tonight, how expensive that would be. So because it could be combined with the salary increases over two years, and because they put that word in there, average, minimum average, um, that truly is great language in terms of this proposal. It does mean we gave a 3% cost of living adjustment last year, so we would be required to do a minimum of a 2% increase on average in order to receive that funding. So the last big thing you might have heard in the news this week is an increase in funding for counselors. Um, when you look at that dollar, it's lumped into our basic aid, so I can't give you that specific amount. Um, but the state is working, um, this is the first in a three-year phase to reduce the staffing standard for school counselors. 
down to 250 to 1 in all schools by fiscal year 2022. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about that, the current ratio is 500 to 1 statewide in elementary schools, 400 to 1 in middle schools, and 350 to 1 in high schools. So this first year, that action would reduce the staffing ratio to 375 to 1 in elementary schools, 325 to 1 in middle, and 300 to 1 in high schools. So those are really kind of the big things in terms of the governor's proposed budget today. So before I go on to sort of where we think we can sort of go from here, um, perhaps it would be a good time just to stop and see if you have any questions based on what we've shared with you so far. Questions? <coughs> if not, we can keep going. The only I have a comment. It just seems like every time when you hear out of Richmond something good that you think might benefit us in any way, it barely skims the top of us at all times of, and it just, it's always quite frustrating to, to hear how little that we get in comparison to neighbors, even neighbors, that we get so much less than even our neighbors do, that we continue to be so heavily, quite frankly, heavily dependent on the residents of Falls Church to prop up our schools. And it's just very frustrating of the amount of money that we send to Richmond every year and get so little return on that investment from, from Richmond. I, th I think that uh, you wouldn't get an argument from us, um, but for those viewers that might be watching at home, I think it's important to note that um, you, you know the way that the state funds revenue uh, or, or funding to different school jurisdictions is based on the local composite index, which is an overall um, measure of a wealth of a community, and we have the highest local composite index in the state. Um, and so as a consequence of that, when we're 0.8 uh, for every dollar that we send down to Richmond, we get 20 cents back uh, in, a, in a 0.8 environment versus our neighbors next door, who, uh, who I think are 0.67 now. Is that about right? It might be 0.72. Point, maybe 0.72. Um, so, so the levels of, of wealth in our little city compared to surrounding jurisdictions um, does then functionally put it back on the, the local tax base. So I, I hear you, but I, I just want to make sure everybody understands that who's playing at home. Mr. Castillo. Hey, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a question from Ms. Michael. In terms of the governor's budget, was there, I, I know there was some talk about money for, for security or for school construction. Was there any, anything in those realms or is, is this pretty much yet so they did have school security equipment grants they're increasing that cap so they're increasing the cap for school security equipment grants from 100 to 250 thousand um, and that was a recommendation of the children's <coughs> cabinet safety work group um, so there is that funding um, I don't remember immediately seeing something on construction I was slightly excited until I read the text about <laughs> they included funding for grow your own teacher which which I thought sounded like a really great <coughs> idea VDOE will provide scholarships no greater than 7500 to high school graduates that attend a Virginia State Institution of Higher Learning and subsequently teach in high needs public schools within their division of residence um, but they said those high need public schools need at least 50 percent of students qualifying for free or reduced price meals at the time of the application Layton. Just a quick clarification on the teacher pay piece. You said we had to have had a 5% increase. So do both a COLA and STEP count as part of that or only the COLA? They would both count. So because they use the word minimum average, we can use both the STEP or COLA towards that calculation. And we had given a 3% COLA last year, so we can count that. So we need at least a minimum of another 2% this year. And that 2% could be a step, a COLA, or any combination thereof. So if we only had the step, would that 
if we only have this 2%. step, we would meet that 2% okay. requirement, although we'd really like to do a step and a colon. Right. Thanks. Anything else? All right, so I'm going to uh, I'll carry on here, um, and and what I what I want to say before I begin to show you sort of our um, methodology for looking at how we can potentially close that seven hundred and thirty thousand dollar gap um, is is one to say that again our our focus and this is not my proposed budget right so I'm just sharing information with you tonight when I propose. Um, I, I'll take everybody's, you know, feedback and input into account. But I, I do want to um, say that our focus has been on compensation um, and really looking at how we may be able to take care of our, our teachers. And also looking at what does our current staffing model look like in the context of our whole division pre-K-12 and are there some realignments and some efficiencies that can be found that actually can potentially free up some dollars. Um, so, so what I've prepared along with, well, what Kristen's prepared along with us, probably more accurate, is um, three different tiers. Neither tier fully, fully funds what was on the previous slide. So this is really a way of us um, trying to be reflexive, responsive, and thoughtful in, the, in this idea of 2% guidance and the fact that we are building a brand new high school and thinking about how can we be responsive to the community and the taxpayers and be great stewards of public funds. So um, what you'll see here is tier one, um, we've identified $100,000. You may recall that a portion of our, of our expenditure budget goes to logistics. And we, we believe that um, we can save about $100,000 in logistics by doing some realignments and some readjustments within uh, the work we're doing. If we were in Tier 1 to reduce the substitute pay by a dollar per hour instead of, um, instead of fully funding it, instead of, um, or increasing it by a dollar an hour, instead of increasing it by $2 an hour, that would reduce that line item by about $25,000 would help us get more competitive. It wouldn't get us all the way there, but would certainly help us in that um, movement forward. If we reduce the COLA from 1.0, a 1% COLA to a half a COLA, that would save us about $200,000. And then if we did some position realignments, um, meaning finding some efficiencies across the division, either in operations, um, in teaching positions and para positions or all of the above and reduced by about four positions across the division, we can close that $730,000 gap. One other piece, two, two pieces. One is we are confident that um, we can do this realignment and not have an impact at all the planning factors that the school board have adopted for the division meaning that our class sizes won't go up um, and, and we would maintain um, the quality of instructional programming that this community has come to, um, come to desire and, um, and ask for. The second is any realignment that we would do, uh, we would manage through attrition, uh, meaning that we experience about 25 to 30 new positions in the division every year. So a reduction of four, wherever those four would fall, we would work diligently to make sure that anyone who was reduced would find another position in the division. Maybe at a different grade level, maybe teaching a different, um, a different subject. So if you're a math teacher and you teach algebra, you might be asked to teach geometry or the like, um, but we are committed to finding everyone a position. In tier two, to close the $730,000 gap, we again would take the $100,000 logistics reduction. <clears throat> we would reduce the sub pay uh, and increase it by 50 cents an hour instead of a dollar, which would save us $37,500. We would reduce the COLA to 0.25, uh, which would save us $300,000. And then instead of doing four positions in realignment, we would do three at 292.5, um, which would close the gap. And then in the final tier, 
Um, the significant difference here would be that we would eliminate the substitute pay increase. Um, we would eliminate the COLA and we would realign two positions uh, as opposed to the four in tier one. So, so I want to focus just for a second, if you'll indulge me, um, on tier one. Um, because I, I think um, as we've done our analysis and looked at what is potentially the best solution to close the gap, we propose tier one because we think it's actually the best. Um, and in tier one, um, there are some reductions, but we also know, based on some information that we've received from the state today, based on the fact that we have very early revenue numbers from the city, um, based on the fact that the 10 percent, um, uh, the 10 percent increase in benefits is a conservative estimate, meaning that it could actually come in less than, than that amount, that what we would propose potentially is that we would do the logistics reduction, we would reduce the subpay by a dollar per hour and make it an increase of a dollar per hour, reduce the COLA to 200, but any savings that we would capture that would come from a reduced amount that we would pay to benefits, any increases that we would get from the state in revenue, or any other savings that we're able to capture if organic growth exceeds 2%, we would pour additional funding and revenue into that COLA. So while the COLA would start at 0.5%, if we achieved more savings and more revenue, we would actually grow that COLA. So if we ended up with $100,000 more due to organic growth or some other savings, that would allow us then to do a step plus a 0.75 COLA. And we would still do the position realignments uh, in Tier 1. So again, this is not my proposed budget, this is for conversation, but I did want to give you all a sense of kind of where uh, we, we were thinking about, um, about where we were headed. So um, before we get into conversations, um, I do want to take just a second to talk about the budget question process. <clears throat> we have our, our first budget question is in. Um, thank you, Ms. Russell, for asking your question about um, uh, about the organizational chart, and we'll get that out using this process. Um, but if you would please, as you have budget questions that come up, submit those directly to me. Um, and once you do, um, I will fan them out to the appropriate staff members, we'll get the answers, and then we will um, distribute those questions um, to the school board at uh, appropriate times, whether it's through an email or work session, so that you get a chance to see what the answers are. Uh, and then we will also mark those as question one, two, three, four, five. We'll catalog them like we did last year so that you can reflect back and see what questions were asked and what the cost drivers were that were associated with it. And then, of course, like last year, we'll post all of those budget questions on the website so all of the community can see it as well. Um, with respect to the calendar, um, and, I, and I'm putting this up here for uh, the good of the organization and everyone watching at home, but equally important, I want to share that it's an integrated calendar, not just with the school board's dates, but also with the city council's dates and the city manager's dates. Um, but some of those things that are coming up um, rather quickly are when we return on January 8th, I'll be proposing to you um, the budget uh, and, and what my budget would be um, moving forward. Uh, January 15th, we'll have a budget work session. I'd like to invite Peak, Seek, Eek, and the SAOs to that meeting. Um, to talk a little bit about the budget. Um, the 19th is the budget work session and school board adoption uh, to turn it into the FY20 advertised budget. And then the city manager on uh, March 11th will do his budget presentation. Um, the 25th of March is the public hearing uh, and of the budget ordinance. April 8th is the second public hearing. April 22nd is the adoption of the bud budget ordinance, including the school transfer. And then on May 7th, there would be a public hearing, a budget work session, and ultimately the adoption of your budget. So if there are changes in growth, for example, where we can increase the COLA, for example, um, that's when we would do that, would be at that reconciliation point on May 7th. Yes, please. May 7th is the first <coughs> Tuesday in the month of May. I know we typically meet the second and the third, right? But in terms of getting teacher contracts out and other things, um, I believe in the past we may have used the first Monday in May, so I just wanted to make sure that that date is acceptable for everyone, um, or we could return to the second Monday in May. 
So with that, Mr. Chair, um, we would welcome any, any questions, comments, thoughts. Um, I, I think what we've, what we've shared with you is, um, you know, we have a $730,000 gap we got to fill. And I think that um, these three different tiers provide us some options. Um, and uh, we welcome your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Dr. <coughs> Noonan and Ms. Michael and the team uh, for putting this together for us to at least to get the, the process started. Um, let's see if any of my colleagues have any questions or comments on the presentation tonight. If, if not, I... I'll just say thank you for putting this together. It's a lot of food for thought, so I, I don't have anything to say right now, but, but thanks to Scott and Michael and, and to you for, for laying out things very clearly. I think it's a good start. So I, I do appreciate the hard work that goes into this. Um, I guess one question, will we, when will we know how the general government's revenue predictions have actuals and projections have mapped out? So we'll get the next revenue update from the general government when they present their second quarter results, um, which I think they tend to do in January. So then we'll get an update on where they feel the projections are. Okay, but have we asked them for what their track record is historically for the last 10-ish years? I would be happy to submit that as a budget question. But it came up as, a, as, as after the meeting to um, December 3rd. So I, I think it would be good to know for, for purposes of planning, sure. Do they under promise and over deliver, or, or how it works out? Mm -hmm. That sounds like budget question number two. <laughs> okay, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Dr. and I want to echo what Mr. Casillas said about the presentation and all the work that went into it. It's very helpful, and in particular, I wanted to, to highlight slide nine. Being able to see the comparison between the general government and the, and the school division um, in one place is a very helpful thing, for, at least for me thinking about it. So thanks very much for, for everything. Any other questions or comments? If not, um, we are. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't help myself. Uh, the, the stormwater <laughs> fund, how does that, I know it's a separate fund, but in terms of optics and who, how the pie is divided, um, is that legitimately not factored into general government expenditures? Or, or how, how should we deal with the water fund piece of the puzzle, if at all, as we look at budgets? <coughs> from, a, from a global you know, City of Falls Church perspective. So typically when you look at something like stormwater, it's in an enterprise fund, like a special revenue fund, you know, much like our food service program is. So any revenue that's derived either from fees or taxes or assessments specifically for that purpose then must be spent on that purpose. Um, I'm certainly happy to reach back out to the general government and get more information on their stormwater fund, if you'd like. But generally it's, it's excluded I mean, when you're looking at operating fund included, revenues. So I guess that there's a reason for that. And you just it. So. I, I would ask if you wouldn't mind writing that in a question so that we ask the right question um, to make sure we get it to get an answer. Does that make sense? Thank you. Anyone else? All right. I, um, I did think one of the questions that might come up, and I'll just, I, I don't want to maybe take us down a rabbit hole. But, but I w maybe I should have left, you know, good enough alone. But um, for us to to do every to to not have to do anything to fill that gap, just so you all know, would be about 3.9 percent transfer on, from the general government. And I, I think just from a context perspective, um, I, I think I think we can I think we can do it within guidance. Thank you very much. Uh, and then the next topic will be operation and governance topics for discussion. And I will turn that over to Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
So we discussed at a meeting a couple of weeks ago the uh, need to assemble a list of topics that um, sort of center around the idea of norms, but um, that got broadened into uh, more of a discussion about operational things and governance norms and this sort of stuff. So we, uh, I, I received a number of comments uh, in email from, uh, from members about topics that they thought sort of fit underneath this and earlier uh, then compiled that together into a list of topics which um, Marty was kind enough to send out. Um, and really tonight, I don't, we're not going to, I don't think, dive into the, uh, into the depths of that list, but so much to bring that again to everybody's attention that you have a list of topics that have come forward. Everything that, that is in that was mentioned by more than one person, so there's, um, there's I think, some level of independent agreement in some sense, because these were independent emails, but all got compiled. Um, that these are topics that are important to discuss, and some of them are things that we've talked about in the past uh, meetings as well, so that perhaps is not terribly surprising. Um, so I, I would invite everybody please to, uh, to take a look at this, and then for us to figure uh, basically how we would like to have a conversation about this. They're grouped into operational things, things that are more like the first one I'll just choose here is having a master calendar of events that the board should have representation at, whether those are whatever sorts of meetings and other community events that are important. Um, and then the other side of the list of topics is governance issues, and this is more about, um, less about how we do our day-to-day -day business per se, and more about how the board does its larger scale thinking. And two of the things that pop out of there are having, um, and this builds on the succession planning discussion we had recently about ensuring smooth leadership transitions and succession and how to how to make sure that we have a, a norm about how that gets dealt with. And then um, the other one that popped up in the conversation as well was making sure that we as a board are routinely assessing our own performance and, and reporting that and continually seeking ways to have ourselves uh, improve our governance processes. So that's kind of what the, the document's about and um, I would welcome some Thoughts about future agenda to have conversations about this in some more depth, but don't necessarily. And I can answer questions if folks have them right now, but otherwise. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, does anyone have any questions or anything for Mr. Anderson? Uh, just uh, real quick. Do you <laughs> I, it looked as if I you were you were on the way the up. Word back in the day, so. Um, a couple of things. I think maybe operational always kind of gives me a strange feeling because that's that's the superintendent. So maybe housekeeping. Um, some of these, some of the things don't seem to quite have quite parallel structure. Um, mm -hmm. Like sometimes they're written as a question, mm -hmm. and sometimes they're statements. You know, sort of result. You know, true or false or pro or con. We should do X, Y, or Z. So I, I wonder if we can. And I'd be happy. Since, uh, since you've done a lot of work already, for which I thank you for, for doing this. Um, you know, maybe we can try to tee these up into more discrete issues um, that, that we can just address head on. Um, and I, I think, I don't know if there's another category, uh, um, housekeeping, governance, and, and norms. Um, you know, some of the things such as, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. Some of these things such as setting the agenda, that's already a policy item that we have. So do we address that and then change the policy? I mean, we, we actually just went over that policy. So it, I'm not sure how we, how that fits into the, the, uh, the picture, but it seems like we have house housekeeping, sort of hard skills, governance, and then soft skills, norms, is kind of how I might break it up. But again, this is a this is a great collection of issues, and, and I thank you for it. Thank you. Anyone else? I uh, just wanted to uh, thank Mr. Anderson for for keeping us on task with getting this stuff kind of organized and together. Um, this is one of the things that I think um, over the next couple of months as we kind of fine tune some of the areas that we want to discuss where that um, 
um, uh, retreat will come into play to actually do a deeper dive into some of these conversations and come up with a, uh, a good working document of governance for the board uh, moving forward. So I do appreciate this and, and thank you. If there is no other topics to come up tonight, uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you all very much.